If I present what I'm about to present correctly, it'll completely change the way you view Weibo cosmology. Now, before I get into this topic, I'm going to return to the question that I asked in my Chi Explain video. In Weibo cosmology, God is both Chi and Eke. As the parents and formula for creation and existence, the nature of the Chi is to polarize into Eke. And in today's video, I'll be explaining Eke or Ne Chuku in ancestral thoughts. I'll also reveal the hidden meanings and secret symbols and allegory behind Odai the creation story between Kamosu and Chuku that I shared in my first video, how God was created, to bring everything full circle. Now in the video Chi explained that I did earlier this year, I started by asking a rhetorical question, which was, if an artist is drawing a model, what is the Chi of the picture produced? Now for this video, I'm going to go back to that question, but with a twist. Comment below and let me know what you think about the following question. The question for today's video is, if an artist decides to draw a model, what is the eke of his decision? Comment below with your answer, how you interpret it or what you feel is right. As always, no answer is wrong. Before I begin, I want to make a big announcement. The full Ebo calendar is now available for your Apple and Google calendar. I have created a calendar that tells the 13 moons, four market days, and different holidays and correlating rituals across the whole of Ebo land, as well as breakdowns of what they mean and the stories behind them. This is available for all patrons who join our community to support this channel at patreon.com slash the medicine shell. This is available to all patrons that join our community within this moon, which ends July 9th, 2021, with the beginning of Onwai Fin Joku. So again, that is patreon.com slash the medicine shell. All patrons have access to an in-house Debia for readings and spirit work. My full e-library, which has hundreds of books, articles, journals, and studies that I use for my research. An exclusive post that you won't see on YouTube or social media. So with that being said, let's begin. This is Derek O'Fodder and with The Medicine Shell, and today I'm going to discuss Eke and Igbo cosmology, the seldom examined half of ancestral cosmology, which ties the big picture together. This video covers Nechuku, how the chi manifests itself into reality, the divine feminine, and the purpose of life, as well as the formula for creating life and ancestral thoughts. Beginning first with a story. Chineke is the sum of all things in Igbo cosmology, and key to understanding the universe and everything that came before it a concept that explains and surpasses existence itself. While it is not wrong to translate Chineke as God, it is a concept that surpasses the idea of God, regardless of the culture or religion you are referencing or comparing it to. By the end of this video, you will understand what I mean. But for us to reach this awareness, we must begin from the beginning. The universal nature is the transition from Chi to Eke. In this, Chineke is both creator and creation, but also the formula for creation itself, the genetic code for the cosmos, and the divine couple that forms the androgynous god body according to our ancestors. As a divine coupling, Chineke manifests as mother and father of existence and beyond. The Chi itself, which is infinite possibility, and Eke, which is infinite actuality, were in the beginning, one. In a time before time, all things were one. This singularity held all actuality and possibility in a single body known as Atu or Alma. In ancestral thoughts, there is no creation in the sense of things coming from nowhere. Rather, all things that are have always been and always will be and exist through time as rearrangements of the same cosmic matter and essence that has always been. In fact, the word Eke itself not only means creation, but suggests creation from things that were already in existence, best translating to arrangements or distinction and partition. But then, from one, by its own volition, the Chi of Atun separated itself from the Eke of Atun, ushering in a new phase of universal existence known as the age of duality, the age of chineke, where all things exist in pairs and manifest or find completion in twos. From this separation came the idea of similarity and distinction, beginning and ending, time and space, cause and effect, and the concept of eke itself. Now, make sure to remember what I'm about to say, because from it, the rest of the story begins to add up. In ancestral thought, things exist because they are observed by something else, which is that thing that makes them whole in the age of duality. There is an up because there is an observance of down. And in essence, up and down are two parts of a single whole, needing each other to exist, but unable to manifest without the existence of the other. There is a light because there is an observance of dark. There is no cause without effect and no effect without cause. 
as both abstractions lose meaning without the other. And there is Ana, because there is Igwe, and Igwe because there is Ana. And therefore, in order to be a creator, there must be a creation, as the creation plays equal parts in making the creating principle a creator, that the creator plays in making the creation a creation. These dualities allow both ends of a single concept to define each other, and within that definition is the existence of a single whole. Even within us as living things, we exist as a distinction of consciousness, because our model is observed by our more, and our more observed by our model. So in this story, the chi and eke of Atu separating is an allegorical way of saying that the Atu became aware of itself. Remember this part, because it will piece things together for the story itself. Once the chi separated itself, it built a four-wall chamber known as Obi Chuku, the dwelling or heart of the supreme chi. But it is what is within Obi Chuku that makes the story whole. It is important to note that the chi of Atu as well as the chi of all things, is intention. The arrival of intention is the creation of a new chi. In this story, the chi is the active principle, the principle by which intention is carried or sprung from, and the principle by which things are affected by, as it is in its core, pure intention or pure cause. Now within Obichuku was inertia, as Obichuku was built to house stillness. And this stillness held a darkness known as Odi or Odu for its ability to cup darkness and stillness. The inside of Obichuku is known as Aku, or the nest. Chineke, as the formula for creation and existence, tells us that all things are created by the spectruming of intention. At the beginning of all things is an intention. In order for this intention to begin the process of spectruming or growing into reality, it must be nested in stillness. And as all light is movement, stillness itself is Odi, Odi is inertia, and inertia is darkness. Once the intention fully spectrums outside of the nest, it creates an echo of itself, reflecting the intention that created it, while panning further and further away from its original source. Meaning the eke, or what is created from the intention, bursts into reality completely independent of the intention, outside of the fact that it'll follow the trajectory that its intention set for it. So for example, if you have the intention to create ripples on a lake, the effect that this intention has is the eke. Meanwhile, the intention itself is the chi. Once the intention sparks, you may pick up a stone, which is part of the spectruming process. You may angle your body towards the lake, which is also part of the spectruming process. You may pull your hand back, throw it until it lands on the water, causing the desired ripple. In this example, the chi not only created the ripple, but it created a sequence of events and an effect that radiated out from a point of darkness, or Odi, which is your mind, and on to reality. And once the ultimate effect has been created, which is that ripple, with the ripple itself being out of the control of the intention, but reflecting the nature of that intention, which gave it its trajectory. Now, after building Obi Chuku, Chuku entered and began a secret project without speaking a word of it to his wife, who sat on the sidelines. Periodically, Chuku would enter his chamber backwards, and then again exit backwards, repeating this cycle again and again until his wife became curious. On the sideline, Eke's confusion grew. Eke watched her husband, Chi, enter and exit, and enter and exit this mysterious chamber without making her aware of what happened within or why he was exhibiting this strange pattern of behavior. To make her curiosity worse, Chi instructed his wife to never look within Ubi Chuku, to never open the door and put eyes upon what lies inside. Out of boredom, Eke began weaving Ogodo, or cloth, but as she wove and wove, her husband entered and exited, entered and exited the chamber, until finally Eke had had enough. Now, according to my first telling of this story, Odinachi Nebere, in my How God Was Created video, the event that will happen next triggers the beginning of the universe. But now that we're dissecting the story more surgically and looking closer at the secret and hidden meanings behind these symbols, I want to ask you a question. When does the universe begin in this story? Does it begin with the separation of Atu, the building of Obi Chuku, or the event that will happen next? If you need to pause, go ahead and pause, then leave your answer below in the comments. At the end of this video, I'll give my own answer. But if you listen closely, 
you may have already heard it. Back at Obichuku, Eke had had enough. Out of boredom, she watched for the last time as Chuku exited his chamber. As always backwards, and as always without saying a thing to satisfy her curiosity. Once the coast was clear, Eke rose from her stillness, approached Obi Chuku, put her hand on the door, opened it, and then there was a tremendous explosion that burst forth from the chamber, which made the sound wah. There are two versions of this particular story which I've heard before. The first says that there's an explosion which makes the sound wah a primordial word which in itself means universe or plane of existence or space. But the word itself is interesting in context to the story. As with most Igbo nouns, it is built from a root verb, in this case being wa, to scatter or disassemble, with the u implying a state of being. So for wa, if you change the u for state of being to i, which makes the verb active, it becomes to break or to separate. Iwa ahon is surgery. Iwa g is to break the g. Uwa is also the primordial sound a child repeats upon being born and entering the world, the name of its first mother, and an echo of that bursting forth from Obi Chuku, which also mirrors the bursting forth of a child from the inside of his mother onto the outside world. Another version of the story says that a great ball of fire or a comet shot out from the chamber and crashed into the dark edge of the universe, causing the scattering of the entire universe. Now, I often avoid adding my own conclusions or speculation to these videos, but I'm curious about two things that I'll be looking into in the future. The first is if there's a connection between the comet and the horsetail whip held by titled women and sometimes titled men, which is known as Uduaton. And the second thing that crossed my mind is the culturally described phenomena that is the landing of Nechugu into various communities, which I'll discuss towards the end of the video. It would be interesting to see if there's a connection between the sites of her landing and the landing of comets or meteorites from space, which can of course be discovered or found out by examining the soil and stone composition of the areas. These are two questions that I'm currently exploring and perhaps we'll have answers for in later videos. So subscribe if you haven't and stay tuned. All right, back to the story. From the explosion, Eke died and became existence, her body scattering infinitely into all directions, creating space and time, and in itself becoming infinite actuality, as the chi is infinite possibility. When she died, a spider emerged and began weaving the rest of her cloth which she had started. This spider is known as the great Udide or Ududo Okankwa, who, like other spiders, would weave in a spiral that extended infinitely into the edges of space and time, like Eke herself. And in this act, covering the universal mother and expanding her essence in all directions through the great spiral. I'll be covering Udide on my next video, which is about sacred animals. So subscribe and hit the bell if you're interested in hearing more. The spiral, till this day, is the symbol of Eke, or Nechuku, in a written language known as Uli, a decorative art style and shorthand writing style used by women in Igbo culture. Uli, like in Sibiri, which I've covered in a previous video, has two forms, a casual public form and a ritual form. Though unlike in Sibiri, the ritual form is not exclusive to a society or organization. In ritual uli, artists perform igon mo, or the entrance into a state of trance that allows them to see a series of invisible lines, patterns, and designs on a woman's body that reflects her chi and the essence of her beauty. The artist then uses uli, a temporary dye, to trace them and reveal to the world the nature of the woman's chi, bringing out her full inner and outer beauty and essence through art. Whereas the non-ritual uli is a casual art style used by any and every woman who is interested while borrowing symbols revealed from the ritual form and using their meanings to communicate messages. If you're interested in a video about uli, leave a comment below. But even outside of uli, the spiral is a recurring symbol for eke and everything the concept encompasses. As the spiral reflects the nature of Eke, a wave reflecting the central point of intention that pans out infinitely through the echoing of that intention, symbolized in the repetition of a pattern which grows with every revolution, the shape of creation and manifestation itself. Now within the story, there is an allegory that is important to pay attention to. Eke goes by many names. 
Christmas. And all of them serve a purpose in revealing the full nature of the story and a whole understanding of Ike herself. In conjunction with the story, one of the names Ike goes by is Atuma Atu. As said earlier, Atu is the singularity. All that is and ever will be. And Ike is not distinct from Atu as she is made of Atu, and they are one. But the title Atuma Atu lends meaning to why the great explosion was caused. The word Atu could be broken down to its root verb, Atu, which doesn't easily translate into a single English word, but comes to mean something similar to cast or throw. The next word is Ma, which is to know or to be aware of, and then again with Atu. So together, Atuma Atu becomes Atu, which is aware of itself. The explosion of Obi Chuku is an allegory for existence, which is Eke becoming aware of herself. Once this awareness is made, manifestation of the intent begins. Again, in ancestral thought, existence happens when two things become aware of each other. Whatever it was that she was working on within the chamber became a reality once it was observed by the reality herself, which cast the intention in all directions, like the hatching of a nest the ripples of a landing pebble, or a thought bursting into existence as words, a feeling, or actions. And again, the breaking forth of a child from a delivering mother. For the last example, Lika gains the title of Ne Chuku. The violent bursting forth in the story reflects the violence of childbirth. It is important to note that Chuku is a title shared by both the idea of the collective sum of all chi and creation itself, as creator and creation are two parts of a whole, which is the sum of all things. For our ancestors, all evidence suggests that the interface with Chuku as a divine father is a relatively recent phenomenon based on archaeological, cultural, and oral sources. For most communities with shrines or Irishi dedicated to Chuku, the Chuku being referenced is Ne Chuku, who is called the mother of all Abara, with archaeology backing the fact that these are among the oldest, if not the oldest, shrines in Igbo land. And while they are one and the same, even on a day-to-day -day basis, we interact with the chi of an individual by interacting directly with the individual, or the physical existence of that chi, rather than their conceptual spark. And so to our ancestors, chuku is nature, and nature is chuku. Chuku, rather than being a hidden abstraction, is a tangible reality which is felt, seen, and experienced in the living world. As ne chuku, the way your chi is seen, felt, and experienced through interacting with you. Throughout Igbo land, you will find Arushi dedicated to chuku, and in all of these Arushi, it is ne chuku who is being interfaced with, often with the names of ne chuku, neka, nono, atuma, neke, and others. This includes ne chuku of Uguele, site of the oldest evidence of human mass production in history. Ihu ne chuku of Obiene, ne chuku of Enuago, Amori, ne chuku of Mbano, ne chuku of Umunoha, and the most famous chuku abiyama of Aro chuku. As an Arushi is a sacred space, portal, or device built to channel an energy and build a connection between human beings and a particular force. Because of her primacy in the pantheon of spirits in Igbo cosmology, Arushi dedicated to Ne Chuku are among the most powerful in the history of the Igbo people, drawing visitors from as far as modern-day Togo in the ancestral era and today. After her death, Eke was buried with Chuku's tears known as Ushimiri and was resurrected as the Earth, or Ana, though in some accounts, Ana is called her daughter. The great water doused the fire from the great tragedy and gave birth to the terrestrial body known as Earth, which would house the essence of Nechuku, and this essence was life itself. To clear the waters, a great wind known as Hikukukamosu was brought to blow the waters aside, forming a separation between land and water. Now, something that I noticed while paying attention to the sequence of events in this story is that if you know the market days, Eke, Uri, Afo, and Nkwa, you'll know that they were recited in that specific order. In order for the universe to be birthed, first came Eke, which was that great light, as Eke is associated with light and fire. Because it comes first, Eke is also known as the senior of the market days and is a sacred day dedicated to Nechuku, where in most communities, women, known in Igbo as Mbeke or Eke people, as women are manifestations of the spectrum that is Nechuku, and therefore events that are central to women are not held on Eke day, such as weddings or burials. After Eke comes Uri, which is associated with water or Nemiri, the Abara of water. In the story, after the great explosion then came great water. After that came the earth, which is Anna, who is also referred to as Afo, 
for the third market day. And after our fall comes on Kwa, which is represented by wind, and in this story represented by Ikukukamosu, the breath of life, which brought order and life in the form of distinction between water and earth. Now, the reason this stood out to me is because the four market days themselves are manifestations of Nechuku, as the number four is one of her symbols, as is the quadrilateral, such as squares and rectangles. It is also interesting because in the Atuma Masquerade, you will see four feathers standing on the dancer's head. And Azeke is paired with Chi, Anna, her incarnate self is paired with Igwe, an incarnation of her husband, Chuku, and as woman is paired with man. This same formula pans out at all levels of existence, as the spider or spiral repeat the same pattern again and again, with each repetition further from the source than the previous. Humanity was born from the pairing of Anna and Igwe, and like the universe, humanity went through its own phases. Beginning with Ugaka, the age of oneness or singularity with Chuku, where Chuku was the sustainer of all, and access to Obichuku was common. From this age came the next age, which is Ugachi, when human beings began realizing themselves as something separate from Chuku, separate from nature, and separate from each other. From there, the connection to Chuku began to fade or break, and humanity grew more aware of itself and duality. If you're interested in a video about the four Uga, or the world ages, humanity has undergone to reach the point we are in today, leave a comment below and I'll put it up for vote. During Ugachi, or the age of self-awareness, we began to feed from the earth rather than from the sky, and the process of fending for and sustaining ourselves as individuals began in full. But humanity still needed the guidance and wisdom of the universal mind, or the universe itself, in order to learn how to live and thrive in the universe. And so, human beings who were more connected to the universal mind, or the oneness of creation, than the average person began building what we today call Arushi. And by building these connection points, the first contact humanity made was with Nechuku, the mother of all Abara, or Kamosu, as she is also known. Those who made that first contact are known as the Osu in some communities, a word which itself loosely translates as activator, initiator, or catalyst. It's important to note that throughout Igbo land, there are several names for this specific type of person. And the history behind the term is very interesting. I did a uh, documentary on it called Usu Explained, Origins of the Igbo People, which I'll link below. And from Nechuku came all of the other Arushi, as Nechuku can be thought of as a light that, when put through a prism, reveals a spectrum of colors, each of these colors being an element of creation, which all come together to make creation itself, but are accessed based on the need for their hue and tone. And when all colors are combined, it returns to black, the color of Nechuku and the source of all lights. As is evidenced by the archaeological record, and the local telling of history. One of the most powerful Arushi at the beginning of human civilization was Nechuku at Uguele. Nechuku at Uguele was said to award her visitors with spears by which they would go into the wild and hunt with, and was at the beginning of human civilization a source of answers about the mysteries of the universe, how to survive in the mortal world and how to interact peacefully with nature and community. Archaeologically, this is supported by the finding of tens and thousands of spears that are estimated to have been built and discarded around 250,000 years ago. I also cover this story in my Osu Explained documentary, so again, the link is below. But like the connection with Chuku, the connection with Nechuku was also set to break. After hundreds and thousands of years, the requests of the people grew pettier and pettier. The final straw for the Great Mother was when a woman came to her and asked the Universal Oracle to help her find her missing cooking pot. Fed up, Nechuku lifted from Uguele and found another home, far away, never to return. Most famously, the people of Arochuku claimed that she went to Ibini Ubabia, but many communities also make the claim of her relocation. Among these are the ones I listed earlier be they Nechuku of Enuagun, Nechuku of Obiene, and Nechuku of Umunoha, to name a few. What also makes this phenomenon interesting is that in some cases, Nechuku does not begin at Uguele. For example, Nechuku at Umunoha is said to have began at Umualamai, where she originally lived, and according to local accounts, a woman annoyed the oracle by asking her to help her find a cooking pot, which caused her to lift up from Umualamai and find a new home at Umonoha. And in these different communities, her intermediaries go by different names, be they the Aquala, the Osu, or the Aro. 
but the ability to tap into the power of Kamo Usu goes beyond these individual titles. In the Igbo language, there are people referred to as Amo Usu, those who know Usu, and in the modern day, this has been translated to witch. But I have no reason to believe that this wasn't always the case, or this wasn't always the connotation the word had, which I'll explain shortly. But the issue is not with understanding Amo Usu as a word, but in the understanding of the word witch. The word wizard comes from the word wise, which is also the root of the word wise, whiz, and wisdom, and in itself means philosopher or sage. The word witch comes from wis, which I'm probably saying wrong, but means diviner or female wizard or magician. And both terms are used for the knowers and researchers of that society or the pre-Christian Nordic society, people who study and apply the knowledge of the natural world towards practical use, the way a scientist would today in doing something like making medicine, for example, all fit in this category of people. Now, when Christianity was forced on the population there, everyone who derived knowledge or does anything that implies learning outside of the biblical context or church canon was stigmatized. Killings of people we now call astronomers and scientists and physicists in old Europe is well documented, as the church had and enforced a monopoly on information, as opposed to praying it away or doing what the church says you should do to cure the thing, came with punishment, either isolation or in the most extreme cases, death. So yes, Amosu means witch or wizard, but with a lot of these misconception issues, the problem doesn't come from our understanding of the Igbo word. It's the misunderstanding of the English word. That's the problem. And I often don't address these on this channel because that's all this channel would be if I did. So now we have this case in Nigeria where if you call somebody wise, they're happy. If you call somebody wizard, they're upset. If you call them a math whiz, they get happy again. You know. <laughs> but yes, Amosu, witch, and wizard are all the same thing. And they are people we now call natural scientists. And that's it. In the middle of the video, I asked, based on the worldview presented by our ancestors um, and the story of Odinachi Nebe that I presented in this video, um, when did the universe begin? Or when does the universe begin in this story? Uh, the answer is a little more complicated than you think. Before I give my answer, I want to give a shout out to the patrons that make this channel possible. Carl Severin, Kwasi Densu, Daryl King, Adaku Utah, Akachi Lam, Akuma Wokuri, Si Nwano, Sesa Salam, Chief Chinya and Joe Query, Chino M, Chukumanze, Daria Mokolo, Ekundayo, Ememe, Eze Chijoke Ujuku, I am Chizara, Isyomo Orihu, Jess Akon, Chris Gina Benjamin, Lady T, Lioness Jade, Liz, Michael, NC Okeke, Nshedochuku, Ezokoli, Ngozi Onoha, Nia, Nick Crenshaw, Nina Wafia, Nwaka, The Igbo Cyber Shrine, Odinaka, Olise Mecca, Okapo, Red Clay Roundup, Ross Jones, Sack Alexander, Sarah Nwafo, Sass, Sharika Regina, Stan, Team Carib, Uche Abweze, Urena Kara, Yaya West, Oshunfemi, and Abigail Vasquez. As far as when the universe starts in the story, uh, one thing that I noticed about it is wherever you put the beginning mark at, there's always something before that could be the actual beginning. So it's very hard to choose. The reason I thought it would be interesting to get some of your answers or some of your takes as to when the beginning was, was because I realized that from the very beginning of the story, the exact same thing kept happening again and again and again. And it's still playing out to this day. The way it's described changes. But in this abstract form, it's fundamentally the same sequence of events repeating themselves. I would say the separation in the beginning rather than the explosion is the true origin of the universe. If you think about Eke's relation to the spiral or the spider's web, you can see that the explosion and everything that led up to the explosion reflects the initial separation the way the bigger loops in a spider's web reflect the same pattern as the smaller ones that are closer to the center or the way ripples on a lake resemble the initial impact. So what I mean by this is at all levels or at each phase of the story, there's always a separation, an attempted reunion that causes another separation, then an attempted reunion that causes another, all the way down to the Nechuku cooking pot stories. But there are certain details shared at each level that gives you insight into the next, because at each layer, a different detail is revealed. So in the first wave, there's a separation. Then in the second wave, there's a concentrated effort by Chuku to do something that we're not aware of. Now remember, the initial separation, we're not given the reason why or how or 
anything like that. We just know that she and AK separated from all my rocks. So in that second wave, there's then another explosion, which deepens the separation. Then the next phase is Chuku trying to rebuild the universe, which is where Ana and the Abara come from, market days and so forth. And from this, I can tell there's going to be another separation. Then Ana and Igwe create humanity and humanity drifts further away. So I think everything happening now and everything that will ever happen within this pattern or this ripple or spiral is what Chuku was creating or authoring inside Obi Chuku. So what we're seeing is something similar to an author writing a book and then releasing it. And we within existence are the story being told. But what's interesting about the book is that the book is about an author writing and releasing a story. And the story within that book is about an author writing and releasing a story. Similar to like a picture of a picture of a picture of a picture of a picture. Before I thought the Obi Chuku phase where there was an explosion was the real beginning. But recently I shifted back to the separation because it seems to me that that phase was a repetition of what happened prior as everything after it was a repetition of itself. Now, I'm positive this makes absolutely no sense. So comment what you think below. Uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already and support the channel on patreon.com slash the medicine show. As always, this is Derek Ofaderma with The Medicine Show, and thank you.